first of all, um, I wanted to say that today's event is going to look at um, issues around how does war, political violence, and displacement shape artistic practice. And with us today, we have an, an incredible group of artists that come pretty much from most of the continents of the world, uh, from Asia, from Europe, from Latin America, from uh, where else? No, that's it, right? Oh, okay, so half of the continents. Um, and I'll introduce them in a second. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank the Ethnographic uh, Laboratory um, uh, Association in Warsaw, uh, Pracownia Ethnograficzna. We are meeting in their place. This place is called Duże Pokój. You, you, you know it probably from previous uh, events. And I am representing the INSPIRE research project. Um, INSPIRE research project is based at the Peace Research Institute in Oslo. Uh, where I'm a, a research professor, an anthropologist who uh, is leading this uh, project. Um, so the meeting today comes from, um, from the research project that we've been doing with my colleagues for the past three and a half years. We've been working with artists who live um, in the context of war, exile, political violence. Uh, some of them might have left their places um, of origin due to the political circumstances. Others are still there. And some of them um, who are part of our project you're going to meet um, today. Um, so maybe I'll just show you. This is the website of our project, so you can learn more about it. Um, Paolo, do you want to go to the artists? Sure. Uh, you can read about the research, but most importantly, um, you might want to read about the different participating artists. So the project works of artists uh, from Burma, M Myanmar, and one of them is with us today, Chuai, who is here, uh, with artists who are in Sudan or in exile from due to the war in Sudan, and then exiled artists or artists who left their places due to political violence and come from a variety of places. Um, Ukraine, Palestine, uh, Colombia, Argentina, Iran, uh, Syria, Ethiopia, uh, Eritrea, Afghanistan. So really a very wide uh, range of uh, artists we work with. Um, in this project, uh, apart from more kind of traditional research approach that we've been doing, uh, interviewing artists, following their work, creative work, and creating this website that it's part of um, a collaborative effort to also show their creative practice. We've also developed a space of common reflection, uh, research, and creation. And uh, this was a space, and maybe we go to the uh, video now, uh, Pablo, if you can, um, that, we, uh, that in my collaboration with the artists I work with, uh, um, I collaborated with Anya Konik, who is here, um, she's the advisor on our project. She's a Polish uh, visual artist, and she'll introduce her in a second. And with Marisa Cornejo, who is an artist from Chile. She lives in Geneva. And we've been working together on introducing a different way of um, researching, but also collaboration. We created this open space, invited several artists that I've worked with for the past two and a half years. We met for the first time last year in uh, Geneva. So the participating artists involved uh, Pablo Gershenik from Argentina, um, uh, Anya, as I said, Chuai uh, from Myanmar, Luis Carlos from Colombia, Marisa Cornejo from Chile, and two other artists who are not with us today, uh, but they were with us last year in, uh, in Geneva, Aisa uh, Debi, a Palestinian artist who works between Geneva and Doha, and a Syrian artist, Mitkal al Hazeir who is a dancer and lives in Paris. So in this creative uh, open space, you can see one of the things we did. Uh, this is a very uh, short uh, uh, impression of that work. Chu proposed a workshop uh, trying to figure out what are the connections between us as artists, as researchers, and then how these connections, despite the borders, are also, also creating uh, uh, bridges, tensions, sometimes frictions, and new openings for creativity. Um, 
So this, this is what we did in Geneva last year. This year we met in uh, Warsaw. Uh, so we've now met for three days. And today we invited uh, to our open space artists from Ukraine. So we have Larisa with us and Edisteva. And uh, we have a curator, Anka Wazar, who is a Polish curator who works extensively with uh, Ukrainian artists. Uh, we have Miwa Kotka, who comes from Belarus, and she's a curator and artist. And we have Dima, Dr. Oi, as your uh, artistic name, nickname says, uh, who is an artist from Belarus right now uh, working and creating in Warsaw. Uh, so these are our guests. We've engaged in different conversations today. We've done some creative practice. And right now I wanted to give a chance to each of them to introduce themselves, uh, to tell you more about their particular creative practice in the particular political context in which they work. Um, so uh, I'll give a chance to each of them and uh, then ask a couple of questions and open up also questions uh, from you. Before I do that, I just wanted to thank the sponsors. That's important. So uh, for the sponsors of this event, uh, the Ministry of Education and Science that sponsors the uh, program of, uh, of these events at the laboratory where we are finding ourselves. Um, and the project is also co-financed by the capital city of Warsaw. And the research project of which I'm part of is financed by the Research uh, uh, Council of Norway. Um, so with no further ado, I'll start uh, with Louis Carlos. Uh, yes, he normally talks a lot, so today he's going to show us something. Luis, an, uh, Luis is an artist. Luis Carlos Tovar is a visual artist, a photographer. He is originally from Colombia, but lives right now in, uh, in France, in Paris. And he produces work that explores topics of discontinuous geographies and the role of post-memory in the present. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, my name is Luis Carlos. I study architecture and arts. Uh, as we don't have so much time for each of the artists, I am I'm going to show this uh, four-minute uh, video of my latest uh, project that is called Jardín de mi Padre, My Father's Garden. It's a project that I have been working for the last uh, five years. Um, it's in the, the relation of the Peace Treaty in Colombia in 2016 uh, in relation with the violent experience of my father during his kidnap in 1980. Um, and during the peace treaty, we had the opportunity to discuss uh, what can we do with the family archives, what can we recover for, uh, from the victims, and which, uh, with distance, we can talk about these objects and this memory. Uh, so with with that reflection, uh, even though I, I didn't uh, suffer the kidnap of my father directly, um, I speculate on what happened uh, during that journey of my father, and I did uh, this book. So this video, uh, it's four minute um, sequence of the book that it was uh, launched during the COVID, so we couldn't present the book in Lausanne. Uh, it was with the help of the Photo Lycée. Uh, so I'm going to show uh, it's with the English subtitles.
El punto de partida de esta reflexión es una fotografía que revela la supervivencia de mi padre durante su secuestro por la guerrilla. La fotografía, una Polaroid que se oculta entre los pequeños mitos de mi historia familiar, es un objeto desconocido para mí. El 20 de febrero de 1980, Jaime Tobar, mi padre, fue despojado de su libertad. Cuenta mi padre que durante los meses de cautiverio, 19 guerrilleros intentaron adoctrinarlo a través de tres libros. El Capital, de Karl Marx, El Diario del Che en Bolivia, de Ernesto Guevara, y Qué Hacer, de Vladimir Lenin. Todos los días a las 4 de la mañana sucedía el despertar diario y milimétrico. Le seguía una marcha en la tupida selva húmeda y tropical del Caquetá, hacia el siguiente campamento. Solo una vez tuvo la tentación de fugarse, pero para esos días de abril, mi padre ya estaba enfermo de una flebitis en la pierna derecha. No lo intentó. En cambio, se inventó una manera de recordar a su familia. Cazaba mariposas y recolectaba hojas, flores, semillas de diferentes árboles y plantas que conservaba entre las hojas de los libros revolucionarios. Durante su secuestro, mi padre también recorrió trechos selváticos y presenció paisajes inéditos en su memoria. La región del Caquetá se inicia en el pie del monte andino y terminan los escarpes de Aracuara, adentrándose en la selva amazónica. Erró y contempló una manigua azul y profunda. La describió como una casa donde nunca amanece. Cuando te vuelvo a mi tierra, y aquella mi humilde diosa, yo daría cualquier cosa por él. Recuerdo de aquellas tardes El dolor ajeno siempre nos llega de manera abstracta y borrosa Podemos intuirlo de manera esquiva Imaginarlo sí Pero nunca comprenderlo en su totalidad Nunca habitarlo verdaderamente esa imposibilidad se ve simbolizada aquí a través de dos cosas. Que mi padre se haya mostrado tan reacio a conceder la fotografía a prueba de vida y el hecho de que mi trabajo sobre ella se iniciara sin haberla nunca visto. Siento mi sangre huilense, invitándome a que vuelva a para acompañar Thank you, Luis. Um, so now let's move on to Chu, uh, Chu Ai, um, who is our uh, uh, free-spirited and committed artist, as she says about herself, whose work centers around the role of women in Myanmar, or Burma, if you wish, but 
she prefers Myanmar, not the colonial name of Burma. And her artistic practice includes painting and performance art. But she is so much more than only uh, the work in Myanmar. She's also be very uh, influential in the coup d'etat that uh, you know happened two years ago, two and a half years ago now, uh, in Burma, in Myanmar. So, Chu, uh, it's up to you. Hello. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, you know, now the world is a mess. Everywhere, everywhere, some <laughs> parts are happening. Starting from 2021, um, there is a, right now, there is a civil war in my country. But sometimes sad, some people doesn't even know there is a country named Myanmar, or sometimes, or often, they don't know where it exists. When I talk about, yes, my country is between China, India, and Thailand, and people say, yeah, we know this country. Um, so my country is between there. And I'm glad today that I got a chance to talk about, um, from the artistic point of view, what is happening there. Um, that is the main thing that I'm working on. Art is the only thing that I can do, and I believe in it, the power of it. So using art, I'm giving the messages to the world, what Balmy's artists create, and also what is happening there using art. Um, the reason why I became as an artist was um, there was a sexual harassment on the street in Myanmar when I was 18 years old. And starting from that moment, I was interested in the life and the daily life and the unsafe life and equal life for women in Myanmar. So for more than 10 years, I gave my time, energy, and effort um, only to talk about from the women's perspective to the inside my country, to our society. And I give the messages to the girl to speak up, you know, to speak out. If we don't speak, no one will hit it. If they don't hit it, no one will take an action. So my art is focusing about this. Since I started to paint and to talk about it, I make a research, I collect more information, I go to the museum, I go to the library, and I listen more to the gener different generations, and I, more, I became deeper and deeper until 2021. In 2021, February, there was a coup d'etat in my country. And this one changed a lot the way I see to the world and the way I create art as well. At this moment, I'm, um, instead of I'm focusing only on women, I also focus on the right and the, the, you know, the voices and the, of the people. So I created the, the painting, collecting by the handwriting of the people in the streets. And, and I collected there. It's, it's, this is the main part that I did at this time. And it's not only that, and I support civil disobedience uh, movement, I, but always with art. And at some point, because of the art that I created, my life in my country is no longer safe anymore. Uh, I was threatened, it, and for certain reason, I have to leave my country within really shortly, like about a week or a ten day, with only one luggage, and I arrived in Europe. Um, the first six months were horrible, depressions and everything, um, because I have no one, I arrived here. And, but art is still, which helped me at this time to keep going on and to keep me the energy again. There must be a reason why I arrived here. Not a lot of people have the chance. When we talk about immigrants and refugees, there are a thousand of people, a hundred thousand of people from the other country in Europe. But for Myanmar, who's arrived in Europe, we just less than 50. It's already a lot for us. I might say 20 or 30 artists for the moment, so for sure less than 100. Not a lot, very few people arrive 
and escape, a very few artists escape, and I was one of them. So I was telling myself, maybe there will be a reason why I arrived here. Maybe um, the people who stay inside Myanmar still trapped there, who are not, who doesn't have a chance to escape. Maybe with art, I have to keep doing something. So I kept doing uh, a lot of uh, artwork at this point. I don't put any limit on my creation. I do painting, I do mural, I do performance, I use my body and I like even today, I meet people and I talk, if you have a question, I give all the information that I collected, what is happening there. Because what I believe it, if you don't know, even though that you want to do something, no one will be able to do this. But with art, if I give you the message, maybe half of you, maybe a few of you, or maybe one person wanted to take actions and this is important for us. Um, so that is uh, what I'm working on right now. Um, um, most of the time, I use the uh, uh, fabric from my country, which is also represent of the the power from both sides, from peoples and the military. They are using the fabric which use the women, and this fabric is really beautiful. At the same time, powerful messages behind, because. In my country, 99% um, or 9999 percent of the family, they believe, um, yes, I can move. Yeah, I wanted to show the photo, but I don't know how to move now. You can see the, the painting. So the beginning is going to the the beginning of my artwork. And then, then you will see I'm using the fabric. So this fabric is um, the people side also used to show the right of the of the women and also the military, they use the fabric to show their power because it's so interesting. Just one fabric that women are using and both sides of the people are used to protect their power. So in my artwork, you can see a lot that using the fabrics. Um, yes, in the conclusion, that is what I'm doing. I, I will show the mural that, that I did, and I won't stop. This one was um, that I collect, uh, that I create the hour with the handwriting of the people in the streets. The one was uh, one I'm in exile. I kept doing a performance artwork. This one is the mural in Zurich. And this, the body part is full of the text and full of the sketch. Ad. The people who stay inside Myanmar who doesn't have a chance to speak out, they send us and I, it was put on the wall. Thank you. Thank you, Chu. Yeah, this is the, this is the signs of the revolution. Um. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know. So the girl in this um, wall, she is at the funeral of her brother who was shoot to the head from the military. But at the funeral, she is crying, but still showing the signs of the resistance, a sign of the revolution. Thank you, Chu. So I think now we move to Ukraine. Uh, since you have the same sign, I think that's a good connection. Uh, Larisa Venediktova, uh, she lives in Ukraine, uh, in Kiev. She, uh, she came, uh, she was invited by Anka Lazar, right, to a festival in uh, Wrocław. Uh, and uh, we have a pleasure to meet you and have you with us uh, for today. Um, 
she's an engineer and a choreographer, but she's also a performer and a group member of Tanz Laboratorio, right? If I pronounce correctly. She teaches at the Kiev Circus and Performing Arts Academy, and she has also written several essays about the responsibility for the past. She's an initiator and lecturer at the Micro University Philosophy, Mathematics and Dance, and volunteers at the uh, Armed Forces of Ukraine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I'm a member of a small group of performers, uh, Dance Laboratorium, and uh, we, uh, we are working from uh, uh, 2001. Uh, we did many, many, many performances and projects, and uh, here it's uh, several of them. Uh, we are working with the body mostly, uh, but also uh, with some texts. Uh, this, uh, this project, for example, it's uh, Shevchenko Unrest, and based on a uh, poetry of uh, Taras Shevchenko, but in a strange way, uh, we are uh, screaming every word in uh, poetry and uh, do some other things in this, uh, in this performance. And uh, uh, this uh, project, it's uh, about uh, uh, it's the name of the project, Cruelty of Possibility, and it's uh, mm, uh, we are following Antonin Artaud. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, but uh, the main the main topic of uh, our uh, artistic activity is uh, responsibility for the past. And uh, this uh, this uh, picture from uh, uh, our work, uh, Dictatorship of Victim. And uh, um, last year, one year ago, uh, we, uh, we showed the continuation of this project uh, by invitation, by, uh, invited by <laughs> Anna Lazar uh, in Gdansk. Uh, it's no photo from this project here. And also we, uh, we are working with some conceptual art. Uh, the, this project, project, for example, uh, with the name Ideal Theater, uh, we collected, uh, uh, collected uh, uh, questionaries uh, uh, from the people with the questions uh, about uh, what is uh, ideal theater for them. I mean, it, it was uh, um, several questions uh, with, uh, uh, for example, uh, which poster, which uh, which costumes, uh, which uh, topics, which etc. Yeah, it's ideal theater uh, as a result. Uh, Uh, this project is uh, about values, uh, and uh, it was an uh, auction. Uh, we we sold uh, uh, sold performances uh, based on uh, famous artworks. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is our project uh, expertise. It's a uh, documental theater. Uh, we worked uh, in uh, uh, different cities of Ukraine from uh, uh, 2014, uh, and also we worked uh, on the front line on uh, in uh, uh, in uh, evacuated uh, school schools, not schools, but universities uh, evacuated from uh, uh, eastern Ukraine. Yeah, and uh, this one it's uh, from uh, uh, from small town uh, Shastya, uh, happiness. <laughs> uh, now it's occupied by Russians, uh, and uh, no, it's not. Uh, actually, it's not occupi occupied because uh, this city uh, not existing anymore. Uh, 
Uh, this is also uh, this documental set with uh, uh, fighters, Ukrainian fighters, and uh, uh, it's uh, Svatovo, and uh, uh, this city also not existing anymore. And uh, this is also a documental center from Kyiv. Kyiv uh, mm, is existing yet. Uh, yeah, it's uh, mm, everything in this uh, in this um, PDF. Uh, maybe you have some questions. Maybe later. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, uh, two, two more words uh, about my, our creative practice uh, now. Uh, now, uh, mostly we are working for our army, and uh, uh, creativity is looking like uh, which caliber of minomet uh, uh, is uh, uh, more... Um, Appropriate, yeah. yeah, that's all. Thank you, Larissa. So I think maybe uh, with Anka would be a good connection. Uh, so Anka um, Wazar, thanks to you, we invited Larissa, as I mentioned. She's a curator of an international collaboration program, Free World. Uh, in the context of Gdańsk City of Literature, and initiator and creator of contemporary art projects, also a translator. She has a long history of doing many different things, but as she told me, she only does things that she loves to do. So that's apparently a privilege, yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, I'll hand over to Mark. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to be among you and uh, to say a few words, I am not an artist, and I will not uh, show um, any pictures, but I can change a place, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, I hope that I will not sit with my back to you. Um, what I can say, um, uh, I work in Wołomin, maybe some people from Poland know already this city, have you heard about Wołomin? Yes, thank you. Uh, so I lived there since my uh, since my early ages. I was born in Wołomin, and uh, I spent uh, uh, a lot of my grown uh, years in Kyiv, in Ukraine, where I was working as uh, a diplomat. And um, my curatorial practice, or like living practice, is to ask the questions, ask the questions to the people around me. Uh, but not to the old people, but only with this uh, moment when I'm really interested. So uh, after returning to uh, to Wuomin, I created a few projects with local community. Uh, it was based uh, not only on history of Wuomin, but uh, also about the history of emancipation, about the history of Polish intelligentsia. Uh, Wacław Naukowski and uh, Zofia Naukowska are very interesting figures who were living there, so I work with uh, somehow with their uh, heritage. This is the heritage of emancipation, responsibility and uh, education, but not education as teaching someone, but more like uh, staying into, uh, into relation. So I made a few projects with the Museum of uh, Wołomin, but also with uh, uh, House of uh, Culture in Wołomin, which is a uh, um, building from 70s related to the um, Glass factory, glass, glass factory that was established around 905 and uh, finished their story in uh, 2023. But before we made our festival about this, so we wanted to ask the question uh, about the workers who was living in Wołomin. Uh, these are not super popular projects, but they are important for me uh, as an element of uh, staying in touch with my local community. But most of uh, most important practice is connected with Ukrainian contemporary culture. Uh, as Kasia said, I translate uh, uh, books, uh, poets, uh, poems, uh, but uh, mostly I am making some kind of uh, curatorial project with contemporary Ukrainian 
culture and Larissa is uh, one of my best friends from Ukraine and I'm super happy that she accepted the invitation to, to Poland. It is not easy to bring people from Ukraine to Poland if they are not here before because they are very involved in the war, uh, they are very involved in protecting their lives and supporting the army and I do understand this, um, this effort. What is uh, uh, important for me is the questions they are asking from the situation of the war. These questions are different than our, uh, than our questions. And uh, when they ask about the Soviet heritage, uh, it's really something grasping me from each angle of my uh, like, uh, intellectual history. Yeah? Uh, all the books I was reading, I started to think how they uh, came to Poland, how they were uh, translated and from which perspective they came to me. Uh, um, th with this uh, very sophisticated <laughs> question, I just uh, try to uh, understand if we really do understand the heritage of Soviet Union that is our neighbor, that was our neighbor. And I think that uh, this heritage should be um, somehow uh, redefined uh, to think about this uh, not as the dead alien but as uh, something like a black hole that needs our attention that needs our uh, that needs our uh, our questions uh, because uh, mm, uh, how this culture was work all over the work uh, all over the world uh, um, is different that it works uh, to, to, to to our neighbors. Uh, there are many questions uh, which should be uh, asked. Uh, there are many texts that should be uh, read. I'm very happy the text of Larisa Venediktowa was translated by me and I hope that soon it will appear uh, in Polish magazine. I will let you know where is it. But right now you can read it in uh, Tanz Laboratorium uh, site and this is the uh, this is a great uh, uh, essay. Uh, do you remember English title of this? Uh, that Żach niczym ne widrizniać się w dmri. Koszmar nie różni się niczym od marzenia. It's about utopia. And I think that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your invitation. <laughs> All right. So before we uh, continue with the uh, eastern borders of Poland will go to Argentina. Oh. Yes. Um, and this is also a link to, uh, to Larissa's practice uh, because we'll continue with um, Pablo Gershenik, um, who is many, many, many things. But first of all, he makes us laugh and he makes us reflect on many deep uh, things that we have in us when we don't even, aren't even aware of them. So thank you for this, Pablo. Um, He's an artist, an actor, a director, a theater uh, pedagogue from Argentina and also was living in France, now moved back to Argentina. He's also a clown, a very funny clown. Yes, clown, clown is a clown. Clown, yeah, <laughs> that's him. <laughs> um, and by, he will talk, I will not say much about his practice because he will tell us about this, this uh, intimate models that he's developed. So. Pablo, it's up to you. Thank you very much. I am very glad to be here. Uh, thanks a lot to every one of you. Um, I, I come from theater, and my question is, as a clown, how to be capable of doing something that is so painful sometimes as drama, light, how can we transform something? Have you seen a circus show? Have you seen the acrobatic work? It's tough, isn't it? It hurts, it burns, it hits, and but there's something about the grace of the acrobatics transforming something that in fact is very painful into something that is very light. Clowns do the same thing, but not with the body in terms of doing the impossible, but in terms of transforming in front of you something that is dramatic into something that could be light. <coughs> I come also from a country that is less light, which is Argentina. And as you know, Argentina has suffered a very, very dramatic dictatorship during the 70s. So that transpersed most of our society, 
my family is a case of that. And after many years of exile in Mexico, I went to Argentina to reconstruct the story of my family. And I come from a very particular city that is a perfect city. That is called the city of La Plata. And it's a perfect city because it has been designed before being constructed. So that makes it very particular. We have three cities in Latin America that way. Brasilia in Brazil, La Plata, and Santa Cruz de la Sierra in Bolivia. So this idea of a perfect city that has suffered drama for me was very interesting. And approaching this perfect city, I said, well, this city is like a model, like an architectural model. So I started to construct a city that was a model. And that was a model where there was something lacking. In my case, is my father who's being murdered by the Argentinian dictatorship. So I constructed a model my father's size, 1 meter 84 size, 1 meter 84. And in that specific spot, my question was, how do we reconstruct a tragedy? What does it mean for a person, for a family, for a community to reconstruct a tragedy? Is it reconstructing getting back to the ground zero of a horror or of a dramatic or traumatic scene, like being capable of deconstructing, dissecting each and every ingredient of a tragedy, or reconstructing is, by the other hand, much more the fact of reconstructing ourselves, the fact of telling the others and telling ourselves the story in a different way, adding fiction, adding humor, adding lightness, or it's both, somehow. This project of the model arrived to France, and when I arrived to France with this model and I started working with this and showing this, I started to talk to the community in, in France. The same way I had presented this model in Argentina in a concentration camp become a cultural center, I was in France doing the same. And talking to them, they were started saying, well, listen, the question of how, through art, we can reply to the invisible wound today is something that concerns us as well, because we have lived the terrorist ex uh, experiences lately, the terrorist attacks, Charlie Hebdo, Bataclan, Nice. So by listening to this, I realized that I was very interested in exploring the possibility of creating models for others, to see if creating models, let's say, uh, a transposition in a little size of a traumatic experience could help others not to transform what had happened, but to transform the way they approach that, they transform, they tra to transform the way we talk about, we narrate a personal or a collective experience. So that's why I created this laboratory that I call Laboratory of Intimate Models, where people during five days come to move together to move with objects, to create little stories, and to finally, together or individually, create these models that you are going to see some images now. Life is not easy, technology is not either easy. It's better. So these are the first labs in Argentina. As I said, Argentina had suffered this state terrorism. Can we switch off the lights? People work with objects, creating metaphors through objects choosing the objects of everyday life that can transform and that can be used as characters, as geographies. This is Paris. Artists coming from experiences of war, displacement, and the terrorist attacks, as I said. Sometimes a model is a model, sometimes a model is a mobile. This is Bataclan, for instance. And the idea, the question of, of the model is, at the same time that your life was changing forever, 
what was happening in the same block, in the same neighborhood, in the same city, in the same country, in terms of everyday life and in terms of their big history. So to create an audiovisual display where the sounds of that day, the radio, the television, the, te the, the, the theatrical text, the speeches of the politicians and the music live together with the visual aspects, the graffitis, the publicities, and the personal archives, all together. That is La Belle Equipe, also a, a restaurant that has been attacked. This is the, civ the Spanish Civil War, for instance. Someone who went uh, in exile from Spain into France. These are the, the wives of the missing people in Mexico because of the drugs violence. These are the mothers of the disappeared looking for their kids. These are people displaced by violence and by threats of yeah, menacing them to be in silence. This is related to COVID, for instance. The world of medicine, the world of pills. These are a group of 23 kids that had, from many different countries of the world, had lived uh, a terrorist attack on their own that needed to create like e common models. This is me with my model of La Plata in Paris. people from Eastern Europe migrating to France. Ah, see you now. This is the fascism in Latin America. This is Syria. Mexico. Russia, France, Russia, Belgium, Belgium. That's it, basically. Thank you very much. Um. Thank you, Pablo. So uh, now let's move on to uh, Dima. Uh, huh? Yes, Dima. Mm -hmm. So let me introduce you. Um, so Dima is a visual artist born in Pinsk in Belarus. And um, his work is a protest uh, to the regime in defiance of which he raises the theme of restrictions and prohibitions uh, through which irony and hidden meanings delicately seep into his works. Um, after the 2020 presidential elections in Belarus and ongoing repression and imprisonment that he suffered in Belarus, he moved to Poland and currently lives in Warsaw. Yeah. All right, so are you connected? Yeah. So it is one instead of the other one? Close the other one? Thank you. 
Or you can ask a question. Yeah. Maybe you have a question to one of the artists that has already spoken. Hmm? Please do have a question or a comment. Oh, there's like three hands already. Okay. So you need to speak to the microphone. I try my best. Um, okay. So as I am a time filler, apparently, um, I just have a comment here. Um, what I'm observing so far, as this is my subjective interpretation of what I'm seeing here, is that there is a one common denominator from the presentation I've already seen. Um, and that's basically uh, a way, a way to deal with trauma, a way to deal with difficult times. And it's absolutely fine. I think this is one of the purposes of art, is to express ourselves from within and to seek for a understanding in society. And it's very important. And this art takes different shapes and forms. And it's beautiful to watch that you people have a courage to come and present those pieces. Um, so I would like to say thank you for that. And uh, an apology that this is maybe a, a very harsh form of interpretation, but um, I think this is a very natural thing to do for people. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's my comment. Thank you. Shall we take one more comment before we go to Dima? Is that all right, Dima? Because there were two more hands. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're not. Okay. Later, right? Okay. So keep your comment. So, Dima. Yes, I try. Uh, hi, my name is Dima. Uh, sorry for, for my English. Uh, it's very poor. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, you understand uh, all that. Um, where, is, where is it? Do you know? Uh, it's yeah, here. Uh, Yes. <laughs> yeah, we have many times. So, I will continue with this uh, denomination. I have a question to to artists. Uh, when you are doing your works, uh, uh, it's very interesting to know what is important for you. Is it important for you just to? get out things from you or you are interested in in how your invited language lives among people yeah do you want to comment while we are uh so the question was uh uh, are you? Uh, is it only about mm, getting your feelings and, and sharing those, or are you also interested in how it lives among people? How it? What type of effect it has on on people? Right. That's the question. Okay. Chu will answer and get ready because she has a lot to say. I have a doubt at the beginning, but now I can answer your questions very very well because. I saw a lot of example right now. Um, um, okay, which example should I pick? So the mural that you saw, one before that mural, when I made it a week before, the military in my country they washed down the mural inside the city by white paint, and 
after one week, I was making that the mural that I show you, which is even bigger. It is 14 meter and 19 meter square, and um, and showing the signs of resistance and the board, the whole of the body is full of the testimony and test of the people who doesn't have the right to speak the freedom. And when we share this photo of the mural, the people who doesn't have the right to speak and they have to be silent and quiet, and they have the hope, they see hope, yet they are not alone. There is a someone, maybe people outside, they might help you. And this is one example. Another example is art is very powerful, and I really, really doubt that before. Before, the art that I'm doing is even, it has even a fat. What, what am I doing? I really doubt that. But actually, art is powerful, not only artists, and also the people that we are fighting. These people, they know art is powerful. That's why soft power and every dominant country in the world, they are trying to use art to show the power and how they are powerful, how they know dominated to the other part of the world by using art softly. If you see the movie songs and the cultures is also following, using the soft power, using art is really powerful, not only as the other part, pe let's say bad people and good people, both sides know this art. And also people who's holding the power, making this whole world a mess, they also using art to spread their idea and their idea and their their um, or fake news is just using us as well, and they also afraid of artists. That's why the military and also the other dictator they put artists in the jail and they afraid of the one a single poster, one song, a one poet. Why they putting artists in the jail? The the reason is art is really powerful and it's affected. And right now I'm sitting far away from home with no friends and families, and I don't know when I will be able to go back to my homes and see my families again. And the reason was because of my artwork. The reason that I have to hide, the reason that I'm running is because of artwork. Why? Because these people know the artwork that we are showing, the artwork that I bring the unity of the people. It has power. And it's like we punch them with art and they get hurt. So let's continue with Dima. And I'm sure others will also comment, uh, uh, will respond to this question later. So Dima. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, um, my name is Dima. I'm from Belarus. I make uh, contemporary art. Uh, uh, installations and uh, art activism. Uh, I show you a couple works. Uh, it's uh, before uh, uh, the 20, 20 years in Belarus and after. Uh, and um, Анка допоможе мне с перекладом, поэтому я спозюсь, что вы пробачите мне это. Чи мене чути? I will translate from Belarusian to English, uh, and you should know that I do speak Ukrainian. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, super. Uh, добра. Так. Так вот, моя творчесть, она можно сказать, что делится на два этапа. То есть, Чекай, э... а я могу сидеть с другого боку, потому что я тебя не чую. Так, угу. еще раз. Угу. Моя творчесть делится на два этапа. Это до при президентских выборов в Беларуси и после. Um, so my art is divided into uh, parts, first before the election, uh, presidential election in Belarus and after. But you mean which uh, election? Uh, 2020 год. Uh, 2022. 
Так, вось. Перший перыяд, это был такой перыяд шуток с Тёбу над эпохой Советского Союза. So first part was kind of a joke and a comedy around Soviet Union. I, sh uh, I show you this uh, work. Mm -hmm. uh, это моя первая праца uh, в рамках того стилю, это раннее. Uh, so this is my first work in the frame of that kind of style. You can see the word stovovaya, that means dining room. Так. Вот. И японские персонажи Годила, какая идея сжигая все это невероятное чудо. And uh, uh, Japan hero Godzilla, who eats everything around. Yes. Ну, я разумею, что тут все зразумело. Mm -hmm. Рухаемся далее. Это так само такая праца, аллюзия на советские шпионские штуки, прослуховка, как я сейчас сказал, ну, шпионаж. So this is uh, 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 another work of mine where I am making jokes about the spies, about подслушивание. Uh, um, Вогулин, yeah, это все вот mm -hmm. эти такие цуды авторитарного режима, mm -hmm. которые вы можете, тем mm -hmm. не можете на, на себе отшуть. Mm -hmm. И вот эти. So these are the miracles of authoritarian regime you can feel on yourself. Так. И uh, чем это фото отметно? Это тем, что я потом раздруковал такие тишотки и с моей сябровкой мы пошли вот до этого здания. Это здание ЦИКа, где фальсификуются выборы президенты. So uh, uh, I made a t-shirt with this uh, uh, picture and I am standing in front of the Central uh, Commission for uh, Election uh, in Belarus. This is the place where the falsification of election is happening in the real time. Yeah. And you can see uh, in my background uh, two silhouettes. It's uh, two cops. Uh, then uh, after this uh, shooting, they uh, the, uh, no, they tried uh, something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ah. So there are some people who uh, uh, went. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. These are policemen, or no, or just yes, yes, or uh, police. policemen? Okay. Yes, it, mm. Civilian uh, no. or policemen? No, no, no. It's po policemen. Mm -hmm. They wanted yeah. to ask you what they are doing there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, they yeah. tried. Uh, and who is on this monument? It's Lenin. It's Lenin. Mm -hmm. yes, uh, it's, uh, yeah, of course, of it's course, it's Lenin. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> it's, uh, this guy with uh, this guy unicorn, you see? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This guy. Mm -hmm. It's a miracle creature. It's uh, Lenin with uh, Lenin unicorn. as unicorn. Unicorn yeah. Yeah. Lenin. Unicorn Lenin. Mm -hmm. yes. It's uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Lenin. Yeah. <coughs> Lenin. Yeah, Lenico. this is so funny that, uh, uh, may I have a small like uh, d digression, that, <coughs> uh, for example, uh, uh, some uh, mm, elements of communist uh, uh, symbolics or authors are seen as independent philosophers in uh, some part of the world, in others there are tools of rape, <laughs> and it is like important to say it right now. <laughs> Because actually, that's what you are showing here, yeah. Well, uh, okay. Dali. Uh, okay. So, Dali, это uh, это уже такое больше сучасная моя моя творчесть. It's more contemporary. Uh, так, это тема такого равенства помеж людьми в огуле. То есть uh -huh. это от, об тем, что немая полу, немая колеру, немая 
расы. Эта праца, она была сделана до начала войны в Украине, но она не адлюстровывает подеи, ну, потому что это неотъемная частка любой войны, когда люди должны покидать свои дома, забираться на самое высокое древо. So uh, this is the work uh, about the war, but it was before a full-scale invasion of uh, uh, Russia, genocidal regime into Ukraine. Uh, so this is about the moment of every war that people are trying to escape and to find the uh, highest tree and to climb the highest uh, part of this tree. Yes, and the tree is like a pachvara, it's called Favn. Uh, по сути, оно не имеет никакого дела в этих подеях. И оно просто само по себе рухается. Mm -hmm. uh, ну, это нагадывает час, который проходит, mm -hmm. uh, войны начинаются, они скончаются, но люди за это uh, гинут, uh, mm -hmm. жертвуют собой. Ой, жертвуют. So this is uh, the tree is kind of creature that uh, moves uh, and is uh, somehow dangerous, uh, but people are dying because of this creature. Somehow, yeah. Yeah. my translation is not okay. perfect. You have to forgive me. Ну, это так само про на, на тему войны и детей. Mm -hmm. это... It's about the war and kids, children. И далее это уже... В Беларуси есть такой независимый портал, тут Бай, сейчас вот это главный редактор его, и она находится в тюрьме. И в некий час я ну, не так с ними попрацевал добро, и осталась вот такая памятка. И я думаю, что было бы не дурно это упомянуть. Uh, this is the chief redactor of uh, a Belarusian independent uh, portal called, called Tutbai. Now she's a political prison. And this is the kind of uh, memory, kind of... Это работа проходится на початок пандемии, когда только все началось. This is the work from the beginning of the pandemic, when everything begins. Так, и у Лады Беларуси... Уся, всякий раз подкресывали, что пандемия не снуя, что не треба там носить маски и все в этом. Authority in Belarus said that there is no pandemic and uh, you don't have to wear your masks and everything is fine. А, ну, после этого я вырушил, что треба заработать такую акцию, вышел в центр города и развесил вот эти великие велизные маски на древе. So uh, I went into the city center and I made this kind of installation with the facial mask on the trees. Далее это уже мое мое деятельство в фестивале, который сделала Мила Котка. Это улица Бразил. Мы сегодня про него разговаривали. А это письма с отказами на мою работу. Отмовами. Maybe you would like to say something about this, Mila. This was uh, part of uh, the project I did in Minsk, which called the Festival of Urban Art, and uh, Dima was participating as artist, but in Belarus you need to every work be authorized by government and by very many, many, many uh, uh, structures, and this letters... Um, is let us with uh, denying Dima this authorization, but he was persistent. <laughs> and I think the last one was authorized because we have beautiful mural in the center of Minsk. Uh, 
так, такий процес був екзамену. І ну, ось сам такий мурал. Це в Мінск? Мурал відмітний тим, що це протестний мурал, там знаходиться така екстремістська символіка. Це uh, протест мурал, бо є екстреміст символ. Там ви бачите таке сало, і ось це uh-huh. такий uh, наш білоруський стяг. Біл, червоно, біл. And uh, you can see the part of, uh, I don't know if you, mm, it's a kind of fat of pig called salo. Uh, bacon. Type. Bacon, yeah, but the specific one, it's not like the bacon. And there is a symbol of uh, Belarusian uh, flag in it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he stayed there. Yeah. yeah. What bacon represents? Ah, <laughs> uh, it's a uh, freedom. 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 Yeah. Yeah, that's a freedom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like. Yeah. Was uh, this this work? I na. Вельмі добре адлюстровує той, як у, у яким стані у Білорусі вогляд знаходиться мастацтво. And I think this work shows very well uh, what is the condition of contemporary art in Belarus. Uh, ти не можеш uh, сказати uh, ось ніяк uh, так прямо те, що ти хочеш сказати. Ти You may not uh, say directly what you want to say. А ти завжди шукаєш нейкі такі креативні ходи, каб зробити нейкий виказ, сказати нейке нешто важне своєю творчістю. So you try to hide it, you try to find a creative way, uh, ways to, to, to cover the real message you want to uh, express. So you may say that you um, All this mural is covered for Sao, yeah? <laughs> yeah? Yeah, it's about freedom, yes. Ну, до речі, знаходячись у таких ось рамках, ти шукаєш креативні нейкі прийоми. So being in that kind of uh, frames, you are looking for creative uh, um, actions to, uh, to survive there. Ah, okay. Well, uh, mm-hmm. ну, я думаю, скончу працей уже uh, комната. Это после белорусских протестов. Uh, это праца, инсталляция о репрессиях у Беларуси. Uh, this installation is about the repression in Belarus. Uh, это клетка такая у автоз- автозаку, куда попадает человек манья. So uh, this is a cage uh, that is inside of um, jail track uh, when people are uh, caged by the police they are put into this uh, uh, jail track and inside of this jail track is a small part that is more jail than the jail track. Далі уже допрос у поліції і турма. Це стандартний путь білоруса зараз. Uh, then the prosecution uh, uh, and uh, and uh, the real jail. It's a standard way of uh, Belarusian uh, activists uh, from um, mobile jail to the real jail through the tortures. Ось, і я скончу би невеличким відео у працях першої ось цієї праці з кімнатою. Яна називається «Залезний бик». Uh, uh, and I will show you my video, the title of this Iron Bull. Mm, I'm funny. Я покуль трошки так п'ять. Это праца, я на нагадує такое. This works так. reminds me. Uh, была такая пыт, пытка, как сказать. There was a try. 
є у древній у старожитній Греції, коли чоловіка запіхували у такого залізного бика і під ним поджигали полем'я. І чоловік здавав такі гуки, ну, подобні до рову бика. So the human beings cried as a bull. І по сутності в Білорусі зараз відбуваються такі події, коли люди трапляють у турму, і гетеє крики нагадують ось гетеє пытки. So this is the situation in Belarus when people are somehow uh, trapped into the coffin that is um, mm, Uh, щоб вони потрапляють якби, в труну і турму. в турму. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is it. Thank you very much. Uh, that work was made in Belarus. Thank you, Dima. Um, so let's uh, uh, let's now move to yes, no, Marisa. Uh, yes, let's move continents and let's move to Chile. Marisa Cornejo, who is a research artist in the field of where's she going? All right, so Marisa Cornejo is a research artist in the fields of memory, identity, and migration, and she produces work that centers around drawing her dreams uh, to give a voice uh, to and interrogate her own body also uh, as an archive of forced uh, migration. Okay, Marisa, five, like five minutes, please. Okay, hello, my Marisa. <laughs> Uh, so I had the work I will show is like, um, well, first I work with my dreams and I do that like three, four drawings of my dreams every week. And I've been practicing this since 1995 when I still start to realize I was a survivor of the coup d'etat in Chile. And um, in this book, uh, the last dream I had at, in 2013 is here, is that I have to go back to Chile with some engravings my father did um, in Bulgaria when he was in exile and reprint them with my body. So I will show you, you can put it now, um, one of the videos, the first one. Um, I am coming back after a few other, um, let's say, experiments to the um, uh, torture cell where uh, the people was tortured in the Estad Nacional, which was a football stadium that was transformed in a concentration camp just after the coup d'etat. And, um, and this is the last of, I mean, this is the fifth um, performance I'm doing, but basically I have to negotiate with the association of the victims to get the key of this place and get the key entered with other two people almost like in sort of disguise mode, and then start to print uh, the engravings my father did in exile. Um,
her sound. We cannot hear the sound. Well. Oh, this uh, performance lasted like 45 minutes. Doesn't seem to be. Mm. I found um, engravings he did in a, in his archive um, in Mexico where he died of alcoholism, and uh, it was through a dream I I decided to work with with these engraving plates made with uh, linoleum in exile. Um, maybe you can forward it, for, fast forward a little bit. This was shown in an exhibition last month in Geneva in a quite important space run by the city. And we did a big commemoration of the 50 years of the coup d'etat in Chile. And there were seven videos at the same time running in an installation. Um, yeah, maybe we can see the other one. I don't know, it seems not to be working. But I mean, the result, I end up reprinting all the engravings. Mm. Mm, well, the um, seven different videos were done in... Um, the first one was done in a Chilean gallery called uh, Espacio Flor. And so in this book, uh, you find the uh, imprints in, in of the first performance. You can... Uh, each uh, page... Ah, thank you. ...is the result of one imprint. I did in Caja Flor, which was an um, art space in Santiago that um, then become demolished and they built a big building on top of it. Um, the second performance was done in, Pob in Plovdiv uh, in Bulgaria in the train station because I thought the train station was a good point to do it. Uh, because this is the place where we arrived as refugees in Bulgaria and then we left. The third one was the Estadio Nacional, where you saw it in the place where the prisoners were waiting to be processed. And the last one, uh, no, the one you saw is in El Caracol, the torture chamber. And the last one, I did it in a very nice gallery in Geneva with a very good, um, this is what I want to show, but with a very good um, filmmaker. And that's a very sort of uh, clean explanation of the process of reprinting with my body. And the series is called La Huella. Thank you. Uh, uh, La Huella in Spanish means the imprint. And it's about the imprint of torture. Just here is a book, uh, which also a little bit gives more context of my father who he was before he was tortured. Yeah, thank you. Uh, he was um, uh, an art teacher. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marisa. Uh, uh, maybe there is a reaction or another question from the audience uh, to the artists who've already spoken. Uh, I know there was one to Pablo, but he still seems to be busy. Anybody else? Questions, questions? Comments? No? They are still busy. 
No? Oh, he's not bit. Do you want to ask? Uh, yeah, I just I wanted to ask. Um, maybe uh, maybe I didn't understand, but uh, how did you make contact with people who um, took part in this um, workshop? And um, did you see maybe the reactions and work of people who weren't uh, familiar with art and you know producing things like this? Was it difficult for them? Was it different for them if they're like first um, doing this after many years? I I started working with people coming from these attacks uh, gathered by a structure in Paris called the French Association of Terrorism Victims. So that was as a mission to gather the victims of these different attacks. We did these first residencies in a place called Cité Internationale des Arts, International City for the Arts, where artists from many different parts of the world are residing. So it was a mixture between artists coming from different violent experiences and victims of these attacks. By doing this, we started spreading this idea of a laboratory in many, many different topics. So now I would say today you have like many, many different publics, people coming from associations, from universities, from art companies, from museums. So each time we organize a laboratory, it depends on who's organizing the, the audience or the public we have. So we have many different like aspects of of the labs that are possible to, to work as a topic during one week. So, but the interest is to, to mix people with uh, an aesthetic background with people having other journeys. And uh, how, how do these people that um, are not artists approach such uh, a task to, to make? Um, are they intimidated or do they want to inspire by uh, the artists, or they just do it very easily. Um. It's very touching what happens when when you gather people coming from all these different backgrounds, because there are a couple of things that are in common. Also, one thing is drama. Drama is everywhere. You just need to ask, "How are you doing?" And people say, "Okay, okay," and you scratch a little bit more, and suddenly drama appears. And but also that there is this empathic way of connecting. There is this kind of underground connection between all the stories. Every personal story is a social story in a way. So that is very touching to see how through the fact of sharing a time and a space, I wouldn't say that this experience faints and, and hides away, but there's something of a delusion of the 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 stiffly way in which we remember sometimes events and it's it's more tender the way the way people relate to that all right so now uh hello everyone Thank you for being here and listening to so tough topics about war, political conflicts, displacement. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, it's the last thing I would like to be associated with my name. And it was really difficult to me even to accept this invitation. But I know that uh, the dream world is about to create in beauty and everything. But the reality sometimes is different. And now I'm affected by this reality. I need to... I live my own country, which is Belarus, and now I'm here in Warsaw. But this is my background. For last seven years, I was engaged in creating the biggest uh, and the first festival of street art, urban art in Belarus. It was in collaboration with Brazil. Uh, and uh, we invited Brazilian artists, a famous Brazilian artist, and uh, helped the local artists also to represent themselves. And we created during seven years around 50 murals in the capital of uh, Belarus, in Minsk. And it was kind of a unique uh, event. 
which united uh, not only artists from such different um, continents, but also many initiatives in one place. Here you can see the whole street, uh, which turned out uh, the open museum of uh, urban art and street art in Belarus. Um, uh, this was very challenging event to me, because while I was in the middle of uh, many, uh, how to say, impersonal or conflicts in between spheres, like uh, Dima said before, he was an artist wanting to paint, and I was a producer, a curator, who trying to make all this arts possible uh, and authorized in Belarus. So sometimes we were fighting, not fighting, try trying, uh, our power was not a fight, not a strong arguments, but diplomacy, which we used to make all this event happen. So I would call this project a cultural diplomacy project, and it was uh, what, sh what really made me happy uh, to feel how diplomacy efforts could uh, bring something new in my city where I'm living in. Because before, as I said, there was zero murals in the capital, and it was impossible. It was only Soviet uh, heritage and uh, nothing from the contemporary art or artistic expressions of Belarusian artists. So I stop here and then I move to my own practice, which also not about the protest thing, but more about to find inner balance, because uh, uh, I'm working with um, with flowers. <laughs> and uh, after this event, after seven years of being involved in such big, um, such big uh, project, I've decided to go into the jungle. I went to Thailand, and um, uh, there I developed uh, the technique how the person who don't want to be engaged anymore in some any social or not don't want just burnout a little bit burnout. Uh, to find themselves, to find the new way to create things. So I have nothing with me, uh, just uh, plants I see around. So I start to create it, uh, the art uh, using these parts of plants. And then I went to three days of um, retreat in a Buddhist uh, monastery. And uh, it changed my life because I was introduced uh, really by experience uh, what uh, the Buddhist philosophy is. Uh, they were talking to us about all cravings we have inside of us and how to overcome these cravings by mind mindfulness. So my works, in some case, I could say that this is, this is that middle way I try to find um, um, expressing myself trying not to be harmful to the surrounding like in nature as you see my art is very minimalistic i use only small elements of plants and uh, nothing more and then i take photos and make exhibition uh, actually recently i made exhibition in the virtual space and you could visit my exhibition just by link and you can play like a game go around to see this art go to the portals and um, to read about it, whatever. I try to use technologies. <laughs> it was funny because my last uh, exhibition was here in Warsaw in the very interesting place uh, called Kamin, uh, the stone. Uh, so I invited people, people to stone and my artistic approach is to create this really safe space uh, the people could really share the emotions and not to be judged, not to be pulled into any side, uh, and they, for them not to have to decide uh, how, for what to fight, where to go, to stay or to leave. And uh, uh, I created the space in coming, and uh, uh, actually I even invited uh, the female Belarusian chorus of women in exile to help me to make this performance so that video help me please to show this video uh, it's what we do as practice also creating this um, uh, I, I 
might send it to you. Not this, <laughs> the small one. So uh, it was, uh, yes, uh, we are right now, um, Belarusian women, we, we gather together and trying to, to think our national songs. Oh no, it's not like that, sorry. I need, I need to, f to close previous tab because <laughs> it's too overlaps. So we are gathering together, just close the window with the... Um, So we meet uh, each other once a week and uh, trying to to sing uh, our Belarusian song, uh, pagan songs, just to be reconnected with the land we can't uh, enter anymore. So it's kind of a ritual we have, uh, speaking songs in our own language, in foreign land, um, but uh, it's kind of very therapeutic. So. Uh, it goes even in that way from from So that's it. I hope uh, as an artist, even living in this hard, tough time, I could continue to express the statement and suggestion of peace, of love, of understanding each other. And uh, I will, even with the situation of any conflicts, I will try even in the stones or in, in the forest, will try to create uh, safe places uh, where I could accept uh, everybody and this is my message I want to transmit to others. Thank you. Thank you, Mila. So now we just move to uh, um, we close this uh, presentation with, uh, with Anna Konik uh, who's uh, I want to thank you, Anya for for the past four years of a great collaboration that we've had. Um, Anya is a friend, but uh, she's uh, uh, but not a bat. She's a visual artist and a lecturer at the University um, of um, Fine Arts in Poznań and a guest lecturer uh, of the Polish-Japanese uh, University of Computer Technology here in Warsaw. Um, she is working with video installation and with art films. Um, and her transgressive and kind of interdisciplinary artworks combine photography, drawing, art objects, works in situ. Um, I think what I really appreciate about Anna's approach is this incredible ability to listen and to observe and to encounter, to come into encounters with. Uh, variety of different people and their realities, and she gives a lot of space for these realities um, in her art film. So, Anya. Uh, hi, good evening. I will speak very briefly, uh, but I would like to really introduce you three projects which are um, touching the, uh, the topic of the contemporary uh, refuge uh, crisis. And it's also in between an art movie, art documentary, which connects a little bit uh, this issue from my personal perspective. So the first one, it's in the same city under the same sky. It's a video installation, uh, which uh, I was uh, recording in uh, Stockholm, how you can see, read, Białystok, Istanbul, Bucharest, and Nantes. And it uh, consists of 35 stories of refugee women from Nigeria, Congo, Birma, uh, Afghanistan, Syria. Mm, but there is a twist. 
uh, I invited then also the native women uh, who are retelling these stories in the first person. So it's not just the uh, catching the narration and the cruelty of the contemporary uh, crisis. There is also a question, a question about the stereotypes, about the cultural context, about the language, about uh, including others, empathy, and so on. And can we switch the light? Mm -hmm. And uh, you can find the old stories in the book. The book is available uh, in Polish and in English. Yes, you can. Uh, and here is in Polish, if somebody would like to. So this is kind of archive of this project. And it was presented like this in Ujazdowski Castle uh, in 2015. Uh, it's a quite monumental uh, work. Um, and here is another uh, shot of the video installation in Romania. Uh, so I am also playing with the uh, with the space, with the time, and with the uh, visitors who who move around the uh, video installation uh, around the videos. So this is a, a stage for me to commun communicate uh, the stories uh, and. But not only, as I said, in narration, but it's also the, the story is a space of a freedom. And uh, this is the other image uh, of, the, of this video installation. And you have the book, so I will uh, switch this quite quickly. And another project uh, which I would like to show you, and it's much more connected to uh, my family story. It's uh, the movie Under Placid Sky. It's an art documentary. I made it in 2018 when I decided to come back to Poland after a long time living in Germany, in Berlin, and traveling into uh, in, uh, being and living in different countries. So uh, the story it's about displacement, displacement of my family who are who were uh, uh, who, who was displaced from the uh, Lviv, so um, recent Ukrainian uh, territory, but before the Second World War that was the the part of Poland. And the movie uh, explain or it's present the story of a small city in south of Poland, uh, which was before the Second World War, once more belongs to Germany, now belongs to Poland. Uh, in Germany, that was the Guten Tag in German language. Now it's in Polish, uh, Dobrodzień. And the story explains uh, the complexity of the memory of different um, groups which uh, live in this uh, live in the city it's a polish uh, group a german minority uh, not more existing the jewish community and a silesia people so it's a, a kind of memory not and uh, very complex a very a very difficult uh, explanation of the whole um, uh, historical uh, political context so you can see some video stills uh, here uh, and I forgot to tell that the nature it's one of the main characters too uh, so this movie space uh, it's um, based on the stories of people but also the story of the of the nature and the last uh, project uh, in this um, Kind of my perception on the uh, on the um, on the refugee crisis, on the displacement, war, war conflicts. It's a new a new uh, movie which I was uh, developing with the students uh, in London uh, and with the Compass Project. Uh, it's our documentary and uh, it's touching the story uh, stories of the young people uh, but uh, different uh, different generation than the women from the in the same city under the same sky so to this project what also was also uh, published a book where you can uh, see and read about their um, about the whole process and if you would like to you can you can check this and so you can see some video stills here. And they are the characters, main characters of the movie. 
So it's a very new movie and it was opening uh, the um, Human Rights Watch Film Festival in London. And I will show you just the trailer and the end and uh, so I will be finished. Diego, Ibudi Kenaga, Ibudi Barume, Idebu Benezia, Agi Kewarusimiri, Chopurajan, Only make a widget. I don't actually know where I belong. The type of home that I would love to build is a place where you can actually hear yourself. If someone actually asked me where is your home, <laughs> I would probably say UK. In UK, I'm sure that my life is not in danger. I was estranged on my own, as well as seeking homeless boy in a different country. I miss my family, my mom, dad, siblings. It is hurtful to dream when you know that your dreams are controlled by someone else. So it's a very short introduction. It's impossible to say so quickly about this project, but uh, you can go to my website or you can uh, uh, buy the books and you can uh, a little bit more uh, experience about the, the stories, about the people, uh, about the subjects and how those projects are connected or in some way also disconnected together. Mm -hmm. Disconnected. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. Thank you to all of the artists for showing, uh, sharing your work in such in such rich work and so many different difficult topics that you address in your work. Um, I know we've almost run out of time, but can we have uh, can we leave a little bit of space, a few minutes for a couple of questions? Yeah. Um, so, who would like to? Uh, is are there comments, questions? I know the artists have been having lots of discussions among themselves, but uh, I'm sure they would like to hear from you. Um, reactions, many different practices, uh, many different takes on the political realities. Uh, thank you very much for showing your art. It was really interesting experience for me as a curator and thank you for being here to creating this space. Uh, I have um, unshaped reflection <laughs> uh, that um, um, when we are dealing with trauma, with works about trauma, we see uh, only the moment of like building the model that is safe and of course it's understandable but what uh, makes me a little bit um, worried that uh, or but maybe it's not the right place 
that we do not see the conflicts that uh, uh, accused those, those trauma. Maybe it's not like this moment in your work uh, to, to show it, but uh, this is this uh, huge black hole that is invisible in the work, but is actually accusing this trauma. That's what I want to say. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll. I think there. Are, I'll take a few comments. All right, and then I let maybe whoever wants to respond. Yes. Um, this time I have a question. So, uh, in your own countries, how is your work taken by your own folks? Do you, do you have such an idea? Do you have any feedback from them at um, any, for, for any, any shape or form? Um, and if that's so, uh, also, do you think you are a kind of a representation of their own misery and does it give them any re relief, any support? Any thoughts? All right, I think one, let's, uh, there's one more question. Let's take that and then you can respond. Uh, thank you. Um, Helena, I'm an anthropologist, so I thought uh, what what would interest me is that when you touch in your artworks and your workshops, you touch upon something which is very kind of hard to catch, the moment when the trauma, it's in the body, yes, and it's very embodied, and some of your practices are very much embodied. But then you catch the moment when it actually comes out and people are able, able to speak. And some of you also had to rework it to be able to speak. So also, what's the relationship between the body and the voice and how to make the voice hearable and how to how to uh, make also people speak again? What are your ways of doing this, your own or with the people you work with? And thanks for all the great works. All right, Luis Carlos. Maybe I will start with the first uh, question. Um, in Colombia, to talk about memory, you can be killed uh, the same day. Um, I believe that maybe each of our countries or conflicts or um, are so far away, but also so similar in the violence, state violence. And I believe that our power is that each of us or each artist is a center of memory. So I don't want to delegate the memory to anyone. I don't believe in any government since I was born. And I use the archives of my father or the archives of my country as a, as a tool to narrate my point of view, my, my uh, perspective. Uh, because it's been instrumentalized in the past, in the present, and um, in in my example about Jardín de mi Padre or my father's garden, uh, it was impossible to do this this book in Colombia. Even I tried before. The violence is so uh, present since my childhood that. Um, you cannot confront violence with violence. So uh, that's the language of art that allowed us to create in different ways. And the cacophony, not only political, but with your own family or uh, in society, it's impossible sometimes. I, do, I don't need to be an exile. Uh, to not be able to create a reflection about my political, the political problem in Colombia or violence. Uh, so um, I did a lot of architecture, installations, uh, exhibitions, and then I discover books. And since a while I'm, I'm working the tool of uh, the book it's like the spoon 
or like the wheel, it can open so many paths and maybe can be a book can be something silent. But in my country, you need this kind of tools to revisit or re-inhabit your childhood, but also to be opposed against the new construction of memory. As uh, Luis Bourgeois said, it's like every brick to build a new country, a new cathedral, it starts with a memory, personal memory. It's able to construct collective memory in that direction. Yes, um, the question about the, how the, my country has received my work, thank you. Um, it took me many years um, to try. Um, as I say, even to go back to the place where my father had suffered wasn't easy. Um, but um, now the young uh, curators are inviting me to to represent a part of the history of my country that uh, was lost. So uh, it's, uh, it's a privilege that young people is interested to show drawings of the book I show there. Uh, Centre, uh, a contemporary art center in Chile bought a drawing that is going to be shown in two weeks in Chile in, um, in another exhibition to commemorate the 50 years of the coup d'etat. And also, a publisher is interested in translating the book into Spanish. Um, um, but it's true, most of the work was done from a place of safety, or when I arrived to a safe place, I could do this kind of work. And I know I have to be kind of uh, careful to not be the privileged one in Europe coming back to Chile to give uh, lessons of of uh, how to talk about the present because the present in Chile has become very nightmarish too so and i haven't been th through the whole thing Uh, about uh, how uh, how my practice is perceived in Ukraine, uh, I think uh, uh, it's uh, mostly it's often it's uh, discussions about uh, what we do, and uh, I like it. And uh, uh, I would like also to add uh, that uh, my art not about trauma, and it's. Uh, Actually, mm, uh, nothing, nothing about trauma. It's yeah, it's about politics and uh, it's about responsibility once more. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, I think uh, when we uh, when we create this uh, this uh, safe uh, safe uh, space, we uh, just uh, uh, cancel uh, politics actually. Like to say, um, you know, regarding m my kind of approach or uh, my journey with this topic, it's uh, I can say it's not so easy to talk in Poland about the uh, refugee context, uh, bringing the uh, and showing the project, especially now. I will say uh, th that cre clearly, uh, but you know, um, I tried to, since I remember, to work with difficult uh, questions and difficult topics, and I am uh, for all the time honest, not only to myself, uh, but honest to the people who I work with, and I tried to meet them and I try to build a space for meeting them uh, in different ways. So um, this is a hard work, especially also uh, with the uh, video installation with moving image. Uh, but, um, you know, so far I'm doing this and I will do this uh, as long as I, I can. And um, mm, But it's a it's a 
difficult uh, difficult moment to uh, discuss and to um, present this kind of project. So, but you can still read the book. <laughs> That's good. Refer to, to the question of dealing with trauma. <clears throat> I am very touched by seeing the way different aspects of a meeting works as this possibility of creating a secure space, as the colleagues were saying. The most important thing for me is the body. Is in order to have the possibility of bringing outside of yourself a ghost, <clears throat> you need to be able to dance with it. You need to be able to move. If you don't move, there's something, and you know, trauma is basically something that, get, that gets absolutely stuck it, and that frozen us. And we are frozen and stuck in front of an image that is absolutely flat, and it comes back and comes back and comes back. While you start moving, and moving is not just moving with your body, but moving is creating a link with a community. So the fact of the group is basic in what we do. It's not an individual work. It's not a, it's not a solitary work. It's a solidarity work. You need to create with the others. And then you need to step back in a bit. So Because the point, and, and, and I always say when I start a, a lab, the point is not what happened, but what do we do with what happened? So in order to take this step back, you need not just a group, but also to create metaphors, to create indirect ways of approaching to the thing. Horror, the way it is, if we face it face to face, we cannot talk about that. We cannot face it. It's too much. So we need to, to create strategies. And one of them is the objects. I work with objects, with puppets, with masks, with little objects, inanimated objects that become animated. And through these little objects, we can, we can put into them the metaphor we need, and we put into them drama. Uh, drama sorry. And, and the other thing is humor. If you are able to laugh about that, and I would imagine many ways to to tell you this, but, but, but the way, once you start being capable of laughing, something, the, a toxic part of this souvenir is just unmade. And this is the most incredible thing you can see in this process. By doing, and that's, that's the only, the other thing, if we just stay talking, it's gonna be, off in a, in a moment, but if we can start like cooking, sawing, fishing, creating something together, this indirect way of talking is going to create a, a fantastic dialogue. I think that's probably a perfect way to close a conversation and start dancing. So. <laughs> Pablo will invite us to his next memogram. No? Will I? Yes. Yes, sure. everybody. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> well, uh, let me thank you all of you because I think this discussion couldn't have happened without you, without the audience. You stayed with us. You stayed through all the technical issues. Um, but I want to thank each of the artists for your courage. Uh, for coming here to share. These are not easy issues to share. You know, it's, I think as anthropologists, uh, some anthropologists are in this room who work with difficult issues. Uh, we know how this feels. And, and so that's why I appreciate this. Really, I appreciate your courage. I appreciate your devotion. I appreciate your openness. This is also not that easy to be open to the other and to, 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 talk across the lines and establish a dialogue and a communication. And I think we managed to do it with the audience to some extent, even if we would have liked uh, to have more space to, to exchange. But this can happen next. Uh, you see the richness of their practice. They can all be reached in different ways. You can learn more. You can engage in conversations with them. And, uh, and
and we'll continue, no? Engaging with each other, I hope. Right? So thank you so much, and thank you to the organizers. Thank you to Anya. Thank you to Digital.